Hey everyone, in this video we're going to talk about social media information systems and how they can help grow a company's social capital. Now the economist Karl Marx, better known for other work, uh, defines capital as the investment of resources for future profit and he identified two different types of capital. There is a traditional capital um, which involves the investment of non-human resources. So a company has to buy things in order to actually make money. They need a building uh, to actually work in. They need machines to create whatever product that they're trying to. They need the tables and chairs and desks and whatever other furniture that employees might need to sit in. And in the more modern sense, uh, they would also need to buy computers and software licenses. So all of that would fall under the idea of traditional capital. And of course, uh, human capital will be human-related resources, and those resources will actually be knowledge and skills. Uh, companies will spend time training people to do certain tasks because they see that as an investment. Once they're able to train an employee to do a certain task, then that employee is actually, well, able to do that task successfully and would then help the business in making value more than if they weren't actually properly trained in that kind of task. Uh, it's also worth uh, training employees rather than waiting around for an employee that already has that kind of training, uh, partially because, you know, that could lead to a bidding war almost uh, for the maybe a smaller amount of employees who are already pre-equipped with a particular task. They can get a huge salary from some company and all the other companies that were trying to get an employee with that skill set might be left behind. So it could be in their favor to actually just hire someone at a lower pay rate and then train them to do that kind of task. Uh, also, it's really important to because that uh, company might have very specific procedures that a uh, prospective employee wouldn't have anywhere else. They won't have experience in it anywhere else because those procedures are very specific to that one company. So that's why anyone that they would have to hire, they would have to train so that they, that employee could actually engage with those specific procedures. So that's how human knowledge and skills can actually be considered a resource that can be invested in for future Profit. They take a little bit of a hit while the employee is being trained because they're not actively working, but then once they do, they're going to contribute more to producing value in the company. And overall, um, ideally, it will be a benefit for the company. Now, the sociologist Nan Lin um, introduced the idea of social capital, the investment in social relations for future profit. Um, he studied social networks a lot, as well as social capital and how um, the way that people and organizations can invest in the relationship with other people and organizations can actually lead to future profit, which is a huge, huge thing when we're talking about social media like this, because social media puts you at, you know, able to access a lot of people, possibly more than you, probably more than you would ever, ever potentially be able to meet and access and try to engage with in person. So this idea of social capital is going to be really important to recognizing how social media information systems can actually help a business, well, make profit. Now there's four benefits that uh, Lin uh, identified from having a huge amount of social capital. For one, you can get a lot of information. When you have really good standing in relationships, you're able to get 
information about opportunities or problems or other factors that might be really, really important to running a business. Um, you know, this, you might've seen this kind of thing if you've ever been told about a job from a friend or, uh, you know, like a job opportunity that you could try to apply to from a friend or loved one or something like that. Or if you're told about a sale that you were able to take advantage of and that really benefited you or something like that, that is a benefit of having social capital you know, specifically that relationship with that friend where you've invested in it enough that they were able to pass that kind of stuff along. And it works at a similar level for a business. With regards to influence, this is the uh, ability to try to get people to do what you want them to do. Uh, as a business, having a lot of social capital with a lot of different people investing in their relationships with prospective future customers or current customers could then give you the ability to actually influence their decisions. Uh, maybe you're able to convince them, you know, if you're a restaurant or something like that, you're able to convince a good amount of people to eat at your place with a well-placed deal if they already think pretty highly of you and you've already been able to engage with them and build that kind of relationship. And then you provide that deal. They're probably more likely to take advantage of it given that they already think so highly of you versus someone who doesn't like your restaurant at all or that you've uh, pissed off or something like that. If you offer them that kind of deal, they would be much less likely to do it, to uh, take advantage of it. That kind of thing, that influencing people to buy certain things or as make certain associations with between your brand and certain, let's say, aesthetics or ideas or something like that all of that kind of stuff can work towards uh influencing customers and that's a huge benefit of establishing social capital with a lot of customers now this also could apply for other businesses as well uh going back to the restaurant example if you have a really really good relationship with a food supplier of some sort you might be able to say hey you know we're getting a lot more customers recently. We're opening up a second location. Can I get a deal on a much larger bulk order or something like that? And if you've been really good at building that relationship with that food supplier, they might be willing to give you that kind of deal for a bulk order of different foods that they're providing. So that can be really helpful. Now, the idea of social credentials is one where, um, if you are connected to someone who is really powerful or well-liked or something like that, then that connection in and of itself can actually give you further benefits. So maintaining a good relationship with someone who is well-liked or very powerful or whatever could open up a lot of doors for you. I think a really good example of this is nepotism where if you are related to a uh, person high up in a company who has a lot of power there, then you can take advantage of that. You can use the social credentials and say, hey, you know, I'm related to this person. I have this good relationship, whatever. They can put in a good word for me. Uh, I want to work at the same company and get a pretty good position. Um, similar kind of thing with uh, you know, a lot of celebrities nowadays, like celebrity musicians or actors or something like that, have social credentials within their respective industries and are able to make it that way. So that's an example of using a huge amount of social capital to someone's benefit. Uh, in terms of a business, uh, this could be the result of partnering with a celebrity that is very well liked or something like that for an advertising campaign. Uh, building up a good, at least, you know, externally good relationship uh, by paying them on time and treating them well and paying them a good rate, all that kind of stuff, building up that kind of relationship so fans would be more likely to see your business in a good light. That could be one possible example of a way that a good, re investing in a good relationship with a 
celebrity or something like that would provide social capital and then give you that kind of benefit. Now, I apologize. I actually just caught that the uh, last point on here said positive reinforcement instead of personal reinforcement. It should have been personal reinforcement the entire time. But when I'm talking about uh, personal reinforcement, it's about, you know, maintaining and upholding, reinforcing your identity within a certain industry or community or something like that. If you're friends with a lot of people who do software engineering and you interact with them a whole lot, then an external observer might associate you with um, a community of software engineers. Or if you make a lot of really good connections with people within the school, like other students and some teachers and librarians and maybe even people in administration or something like that. If you make all those kinds of connections and reinforce that idea, reinforce those relationships, um, you might kind of build up this identity of being an academic. Just as very brief examples, the textbook also talks about if you have a lot of connections in the financial industry, you might end up becoming a or building up this identity of being you know a financial guru or something like that so this reinforcing of identity within the circles that you run in uh relate especially related to the people that you're connecting with is the idea of personal reinforcement here now hank flap uh defined the value of social capital as being determined by the number of relationships in a social network, the actual strength of those rela relationships, and the resources controlled by the connections that you make. So you want to have connections with a lot of people, but you want to maintain those connections. You want to keep them very, very strong. Because if you are just acquaintances with a thousand people, that social capital that you get might be very, very small. But if you are really, really close to, uh, let's say 12 people or something like that, being really, really close to 12 people might be even a really big number. But if you're really close to 12 people, those relationships are going to be really, really strong. And there's a high you know, potential for social capital, depending on the actual resources that the people that you're really, really close to control. But, you know, the resources themselves are also really important. Can those people get you access to things that you need, connected to other people, all that kind of stuff? We'll go into that a little more in a bit. Now for social capital and organizations. Uh, in the past, organizations have created social capital with potential and current customers through the use of salespeople, through customer support to help resolve problems, through public relations to address, uh, both to address uh, bad things that happen and also promote a positive brand image, and also through celebrity endorsements to give a positive relationship to people who happen to like that celebrity. Now with social media, they also have social media engagement where they can directly reach out to people or people can see the kinds of things that they're posting and interact with them. So that kind of engagement where people interact with the organization and then get attention back from the organization or where organizations reach out to people can help build social capital. Now that's not 100% the case. There's a lot of people who hate being contacted by companies and that comes with a lot of risk as we uh, discussed previously. But there's a lot of possible social capital to be made through social media engagement. And I'm not just talking about like brand deals or something like that where they're uh, working with influencers to advertise. I'd uh, actually count that somewhere around the range of celebrity endorsements or something like that, but also uh, an organization's social media account where they actually go out and talk to people th through the social media team. So 
all of that kind of stuff can build social capital. Now, we had those three determining factors of how valuable social capital is that Hank Flapp gave, and we're actually going to take a look at each of those and look at how an organization can actually grow that, uh, that particular determining factor. So I'm going to start out here by uh, how an organization can grow their social network, which in turn grows the number of relationships that they actually have, which makes uh, their social capital a lot more valuable. So word of mouth uh, advertising has always been super effective. Um, are you going to be more likely to trust 10 anonymous online reviewers, or are you going to be more likely to trust your friend if both you know, the 10 anonymous reviewers and your friend are recommending a product? You might be more likely to actually trust your friend, especially if your friend has a good amount of experience with whatever the product actually is or you know whether they've used it or whether they know about the technology behind it or you know, whatever if they have some metric for saying hey this is a good product to use you might believe your friend more even if they don't even if they've just like used it a little bit and they say hey this is great you might be more likely to trust your friend so word of mouth can be really effective. It can help bring new customers in that might not have otherwise been reached by other advertising uh, techniques. Now, this is going to be amplified by social media because rather than a friend just telling you about a positive experience with a product, that friend could post it on their social media and all of their followers or friends or whatever, including you, might see it and then might have some sort of positive uh, thought about that product or the company or whatever. They might be more interested in it. They might be more likely to buy it. So customers are going to have larger social networks online than they would offline. You're probably going to be following more people online than you are friends with offline, and you might have more followers online than you have friends offline, depending on how you do social media. So when you say something online, it's going to be seen a lot more than if you say something offline. And that in and of itself will make uh, word of mouth advertising much more effective on a social media than off of a social media. But the uh, other thing to take into account is recommendation algorithms, because a friend might not even have to say anything. They might just like the company's page or like the product, you know, post about the product or something like that. And the social media site might see this interest and then start recommending that product or that company or something like that to other people in that friend's social media, including you. So you might, quote unquote, organically start seeing a lot more posts about that product or company or something like that specifically because you have a friend that likes that product. And then this might get amplified further and further and further if more friends, you know, see that kind of product and then buy it and then also like it and start interacting with posts about that product or something like that, it can turn into a feedback loop where more and more and more people are buying that product and interacting with the product in the company. And then you start seeing it even more and more and more and it becomes more and more pervasive until possibly you end up buying it as well. It would definitely increase your chances of going out and buying it or might even increase your chances of buying it as opposed to a different company's product, like variation of the product. So all of that by itself, the way that social media looks at community structure in order to make recommendations for targeted advertising or posts or something like that, helps make word of mouth advertising very, very effective over social media.
There's also influencer marketing because influencers on social media, the, the people who are big enough on social media that they're able to use their capital, their social capital to influence the actions of others. That's where the term influencer comes in. Uh, marketing with them can be way more effective than marketing with a traditional uh, non-influencer celebrity. Uh, I, I want to specify a traditional celebrity that's not already an influencer because there are a number of more traditional celebrities that also are influencers. So the traditional celebrity endorsement might be a lot less effective than an influencer endorsement because an influencer is able to reach a lot more people and use that social capital, that almost one-sided social capital. We have an example of what I was talking about with recommendation algorithms and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you have a wedding photographer's Facebook page and they maybe they helped uh, photograph the one of these people's weddings and that person and their relatives or something like that all started liking this photographer's Facebook page so they can see their own photos as well as the other photos because they really like the work of that photographer, right? Well, user one and user three right here are involved in a number of communities and these arrows are actually going to represent how recommendation might actually pass along that wedding photographer's Facebook page down through these different uh, communities, through these different networks right here uh, and sort of help that photographer advertise uh, their Facebook page with very minimal effort because user one is going to like it and then the social media site is going to pick that up and say hey users four five and six you're friends with user one or you're in the same community as user one um do you want to like this page because user one likes it and because user one likes it and is in your community you might also be interested in and then maybe user six actually does like it. So then that information gets passed down to users 10, 11, and 12. Hey, users 10, 11, and 12, your friend or fellow community member, user six, really liked this Facebook page. So do you want to check it out as well? And so on and so forth. User 12 spreads it to user seven, who's able to spread it to user three. Uh, user three already was uh, spreading it back towards nine and eight. So maybe user three wouldn't actually see it but you get these like uh arrows like that that would be an example of how uh social media can be used to much more effectively broadcast uh someone's organization or services or something like that through this sort of amplified word of mouth type of uh, advertising because it's not even directly word of mouth anymore it's not even like user one is necessarily has to post about it maybe user one is liking and tagging people in these photos and all that kind of stuff maybe they're just liking the page but there doesn't have to be all that much effort from user one in order for word of mouth advertising to happen to users four five and six uh, because if user one was talking about it, that would be a lot more effort than just liking or tagging people or liking the page or sharing the post or whatever. So it really amplifies the effectiveness of word of mouth advertising here. And then because that effectiveness is amplified, it allows this wedding photographer here to grow their uh, network, to grow their social capital by means of connecting with more people. Also, I want to briefly clarify why they're using social network and not community here. Um, this is a social network because it involves, let's say social network two right here, would be a social network rather than maybe just a community because it involves the users right here, users one, four, five, and six, but it also involves the relationships that they have. So specifically, this is the social network Social network two is the social network of people who are connected to user one as well as user one themselves because user one is themselves so that they're self-connected. 
uh, social network four is the social network of people who are connected to user three right here. Social network three is the social network of people who are connected to user six and so on and so forth. And social network one is of course the social network of people who are, you know, following or liking or whatever that wedding photographers. Oh, well, because it's Facebook, I guess it's liking the wedding photographers Facebook page. Um, but the whole thing is taking place on Facebook as a social media. Um, right here, we just have really small social networks. So you could also have a social network that comprised, that's comprised of all of the users here, as well as the wedding photographer. That in and of itself could be one social network. But in this case, we're looking at these like micro social networks here because uh, they just contain a small amount of users and the relationships that, that those users have with each other, which in this case is the fact that they are connected to user one. So now let's talk about the strength of the relationship because, you know, you could be connected to a thousand people, but if your connection is not very strong at all, if all you've really done is just shook hands with them and then forgotten their name, then you're not really going to be able to profit from those relationships if you are trying to make relationships in terms of the profit that you're going to get out of them, if that's your goal. Um, you want to make a deep connection with the people that you are connected to. And if your goal is to get something from people, whether you're doing this as an organization or if this just the type of person that you, you are, you're going to get more from people when you have a closer relationship with them, when you have a stronger relationship. So, so let's actually talk about what a strong relationship means. If we have person X and person Y, person X has a strong relationship with Y if Y is more likely to do something for X. If Y will do something that benefits X, X's relationship with Y is strong. And this isn't necessarily symmetric, especially given that we are in an age of social media and it's really easy to build a relationship with someone without actually like really connecting to them face to face or knowing them face to face or something like that. An example might be an influencer. If X is an influencer and has a thousand fans or something like that, and X has done a lot to make their fans like them, then X's relationship with Y is going to be really strong because Y might be likely to do something for X, like buy a product that X recommends or uh, participate in a trend that would benefit X or something like that. But the other way around, it wouldn't be the same thing. X would not be very likely to do something for Y because Y is maybe one of like a thousand different people. And it's kind of hard. It would probably be very hard for X to even imagine them, like comprehend that number of people enjoying their content. That's something that a lot of uh, content creators on different sites say nowadays, especially as they get into the hundreds of thousands, the millions, the tens of millions of followers, it gets harder and harder to imagine each individual person as being a person. So Y's relationship with X is probably weak, but X's relationship with Y is might be strong if Y is a super fan or something like that. So that's what I mean when I say that it's not symmetric. It doesn't necessarily go both ways. And that's a really interesting aspect of social networks, especially if we look at social networks over a website like Twitter, where you follow someone, but that doesn't mean they have to follow you back. So you can have a relationship with that person, but they might not have much, if any, of a relationship with you other than, oh, this person likes my stuff. Uh, this is as opposed to Facebook, where the relationships are symmetric to some extent. Uh, you are friends with a person and they are friends with you. There's no way to undo one side of that. You are either friends both ways. You're either both friends with each other or you are not friends at all. So we can actually look at asymmetrical uh, relationships like this. 
Now, Benjamin Franklin identified that you could strengthen a relationship by asking someone for a favor. Funny enough, um, like if you're asking someone to do something for you, they might actually like you more depending on what you're asking for them and if you already have a positive relationship. Uh, we as humans love to help. We love to help each other out. We love to help when someone asks us for a favor. Um, I, I say that in as a generalization. It might not be universally true, but that tends to be the case. It's been observed uh, pretty frequently. So when people are asked to help and they're able to help, they might feel like they have a stronger relationship with you. Uh, businesses will often ask for uh, favors from people or other businesses or something like that. Uh, those favors being, you know, you can boil down those favors and you'll get influence or information or social credentials or positive reinforcement. Um, you know, some additional value that then you're kind of cashing in, not only cashing in a little bit on social capital, but you're also increasing your social capital by making that relationship stronger because people love to help. So that's a uh, key insight that a lot of businesses will use in order to try to increase social capital in order to try to uh, get more customers and all that kind of stuff. This might be something like on social media, a business asking everyone to you know, like their page or make a particular tweet or not a particular tweet, but like tweet with a particular hashtag, let's say, or something like that. Uh, a music artist might ask their fans to stream their songs on Spotify repeatedly and try to take advantage of the Spotify algorithms in order to boost how popular those uh, songs actually appear to be and make more money for them and all that kind of stuff and fans uh, will do it and they'll feel more connected to the artist because they were helping that artist out. I see that a lot in K-pop fans and then I remember Justin Bieber actually tried to do something along those lines as well. I haven't seen that continue recently but I'm not super plugged into social media anyway so you know whatever. But you can strengthen your relationships by asking people for a favor. And this only goes so far. If you're constantly asking for favors, but you're not giving anything back, that's not going to be the best because eventually people will feel like you're taking advantage of them, which you kind of are, and they'll stop helping and the strength of the relationship actually goes down. So the value does need to go both ways, but it doesn't necessarily need to be symmetrical. Um, I want to go back to the idea of an artist asking their uh, people to stream their songs and all that kind of stuff to help them look more popular, get awards, get more money, all that kind of stuff. That can be a huge benefit to them, especially if they have a ton of fans who are doing that kind of thing, but they need to provide the music for the fans and make it something that fans actually enjoy listening to, to some extent. It doesn't necessarily need to be the best quality or anything like that, but they need to give something back. Uh, maybe they also need to engage with fans uh, because that will not only give the fans that get engaged with validation, you know, oh my gosh, this musician shared my post about how to maximize the amount of hits on Spotify that you can get by repeatedly streaming a song or this musician shared the art that I made inspired by the music or something like that. You know, that person would feel really good, but then also other fans would feel really good because it's, you get this uh, sensation of, Hey, that could have been me. And maybe it will be someday. If I keep on engaging with the work, and keep on doing this uh, free advertising and all the streaming and whatever. That's just like one example of how that could work. You could possibly, as a thought experiment, think of any random company 
look at their Twitter, see how they provide value to the relationships with their customers and how that in turn might build their social capital. It might be worth looking at. I think a very interesting case study here is Wendy's Twitter because uh, them being snarky, like having this like snarky persona and being sarcastic and insulting people and dunking on people and all that kind of stuff doesn't directly benefit them and it might even drive a couple people away who got dunked on by Wendy's. But overall, it's a really interesting case study to see how people built a positive brand image of Wendy's based on all of that. So if you want to look at a really neat example of uh, social capital like this, maintaining social capital, I would recommend Wendy's Twitter. Um, don't interact with them, though, because uh, that's uh, free advertising. I And honestly, I don't actually even know if they still do that snarky thing, but I remember that being a huge thing in like the early 2000s. So my sources could be dated. Not early 2000s, early 2010s. My sources could be dated. But if they're still doing that kind of thing, or if Arby's is still doing their like fan service related, you know, like fandom thing with their sandwich advertisements or whatever, it might be really interesting to look at all of those uh, social media accounts and see what's going on and how they're building social capital. Now, I kind of got into this uh, on the previous slide here, but frequent interactions are going to strengthen the relationship because organizations must provide value to the relationship and induce others to continue providing favors in return, whether that's buying their products or streaming their songs or you know, whatever. You have to have this back and forth of providing value to the relationship in order to build the strength of that relationship and then induce other people to do the things that you want to, thanks to your social capital and so on and so forth. If you continue this over and over and over again, you build their strength, you build the strength, you build the strength and people like you more and more and more and more. And all of a sudden you have a lot of very strong relationships. So managing those relationships through things like a social media team or something like that is going to be really important. Now, with regards to resources, because it can be very helpful to be connected to very powerful people, but you know, everyone has resources of some kind, whether that's money or knowledge, social connections, access to other people who are really powerful or something like that, and they can make an introduction, you know, access to other things you might need, whether that's uh, inputs for a supply chain or uh, technology, like a used computer that you uh, need to do something with or whatever, all that kind of thing. Everyone has at least some amount of resources. Even, you know, I, I keep talking about fast food um, accounts, social media accounts, and a lot of the people that they're advertising to aren't crazy wealthy, but they have enough money to buy a meal that they're advertising or something like that. That would be resources. Uh, so everyone has resources to some extent. Now, the thing is, is that how valuable those resources are might be dependent on the organizational strategy. If I, as a teacher, was very well connected with the CEO of a lithium mining company, that person has a lot of resources but those resources might not be super valuable to me. So that social capital might not be as high as it possibly could be. Whereas um, if that same CEO of a lithium mining company was connected to a computer technology company, or not even a computer technology company, but like a battery manufacturer, that would be a very very high value resource for them because lithium ion batteries are like the next big thing in battery technology. So the value of resources can be dependent on an organizational strategy. 
uh, I talked about how, um, you know, fast food companies are building relationships with, with people who don't have the most amount of money. Like most of their relationships are going to be people who don't have a ton of money. And that might affect how valuable, you know, those relationships are, how much social capital they get out of, you know, them not having a ton of money. But they'll get more value out of those relationships than, let's say, Ferrari would get if it had those same relationships. Because Ferrari doesn't really care about people who don't have a ton of money. So that money, uh, it has a certain amount of value, but, you know, value in terms of how much actual money it is, but in terms of social capital, the amount that it contributes to the value of social capital is, um, it might be different between a fast food company and Ferrari. In a similar example, um, the company Spotify might get more value out of uh, some musicians' followers. They might get more value out of the fact that a musician has a ton of followers, access to all those people. Spotify might get more value out of that than Ferrari would for a similar reason. Um, because more people you know, all those followers would be more likely to use Spotify than to get a Ferrari. So, number of people, you know, the, the number of people that a particular person is connected to, that resource could be a different amount of valuable based on the actual organizational strategy of the company, where Ferrari has the strategy of being really high-end and appealing to a select amount of people who have a ton of money versus fast food companies or apps having a uh, organizational strategy of um, not worrying about like making their product the absolute best quality that it could be in order to be more accessible to more people. So coming back to this total idea of social capital, the book talks about this sort of relationship that you have where it's kind of multiplicative and i wanted to get into this a little more um the reason why we talk about something being mul multiplicative here rather than additive is because you know i was talking about the example of like if you are connected with a million people but you don't have that strong of a relationship with them then you might not get a ton of social capital out of that relationship because relationship strength is really small and number of relationships is really big you're still going to get if relationship strength is like really 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 small like less than one greater than zero um you're going to get a very small social capital value um or if you have really strong relationships with a lot of people who don't have a ton of wealth or resources or something like that that might be similar to having few re few relationships with a lot you know people who have a lot of resources with multiplicative reasoning here the numbers kind of balance out where you can take all that kind of stuff into consideration what whereas with it was additive you know if you have a million very weak relationships that would present a very high social capital value because it's still like a million relationships, which isn't necessarily how it works out in the real world. So we have this like vague multiplicative kind of thing. It's not exact, it's not an exact model, um, but it's a way of thinking about it if you're mathematically inclined. If you're not mathematically inclined, don't worry about it. It's just a way to possibly think about everything here. All right, well, we've gotten into this whole discussion of how social media and the information systems involved with social media can help increase social capital here. Um, the next video is going to be about how businesses can actually earn revenue from social media.